Next on our list is Melissa Bowerman of the Royal Alberta Museum from Edmonton, Alberta. Co-authors Darren Tanky, RTMP, and Roger Kehoe of Edmonton, Alberta. On the recovery of a giant fossil tree stump by a barge from a remote Alberta field locality. So this project was a result of a successful collaboration to uh, collect a very large and impressive specimen. Most of you at some point have probably collected petrified wood. In Alberta, the fossil is so common, it's actually one of the emblems of Alberta. It is the provincial stone. At the Royal Alberta Museum, um, we have been planning a renewal or renovation for some time. And our current plan is to open a new facility in the heart of downtown Edmonton in about four years. And so because of this new plan, wow, that went fast. Because of this new plan for a new facility, the curatorial programs at our museum have identified certain needs or target specimens for, that or for this new facility. The geology program, I have identifi identified petrified wood as one of our targets. Um, and we were lucky that a member of the public actually reported a giant petrified tree stump that they had found in the fall of 2011. Don and Julie Waddell had been hunting in the area northwest of Edmonton, elk hunting, and they saw what they saw was an enormous tree stump. And when they approached it, they found out that it was actually petrified. So they reported it, and we, were, we got in touch with the Royal Tyrell Museum to see if this was a specimen that we should try to collect for the province and preserve. So the location that this stump was found is northwest of Edmonton, south of the town of Fox Creek, about an hour's drive by gravel, on gravel roads and about 20 minutes upstream on the Athabasca River. So very remote, not really a lot of close road access to the site. In this area, a unit of rock was exposed called the Pascapoo Formation, an early Paleocene Formation, which is where our tree comes from. And the Pascapoo Formation is well known in the Edmonton region because it, is used, it was used for building stone around 100 years ago. Government House, which is located in front of the current Royal Alberta Museum, features the sandstone from this formation, and parts of the legislature also feature this sandstone. So once we had... There we go. Once we got in touch with Terrell, I, was con or I contacted Darren Tankey, who responded with what I later found out was his characteristic enthusiasm, and to, he said that we should get out there as soon as possible to assess the site and the specimen itself. We were overwhelmed with the size of the specimen and the quality of the preservation. There are two modes of preservation in this sample. It is both silicified, the majority of it is silicified, but there is a thin veneer of coal that's still preserved in parts of the specimen on the, on the exterior and also in parts of the interior. The, Diameter of the specimen is just over 2 meters, and the basal circumference is actually 5.8 meters, so it's quite sizable. There's also small-scale details have been preserved quite well, and because of the natural ble bleaching effect, because it's been exposed for some time, uh, the rings are visible, there are nice pockets of agate, so this specimen has high display quality as, or value as well. So based on our field assessment, we made an estimate of the size of the stump, or the weight of the stump, somewhere between six and 10,000 pounds. Um, and we tried to make a plan to, f to collect the specimen. Um, it was thought that we could try to move it over land to a road, um, but because of the steep terrain in the area, we thought it would be an excessive risk to both the crew and the specimen. It could have been lifted into a boat over the transom, but that would require an excessive amount of timber and an on-site crane and seemed overly complicated. So it was thought instead to use the same amount of timber to build a dedicated craft. So we got in touch with um, Roger Kehoe of Kehoe Marine Parts who's been building uh, jet boats and traveling on the Basque River for over 30 years. He designed the boat to be 20 feet long, 8 feet wide, and 17 and a half inches tall. The maximum weight that it would be able to carry would be around 10,000 pounds, which was the upper limit of our estimate. He added some design features. Um, for instance, the bow was radius so that it would plane properly while being moved over water. Uh, he also installed a removable 3,500 pound two-piece stub axle through the 
hull uh, with pin assemblies on the wheels so that when it was in the water, the wheels and the axle could be removed. Um, and also there was a hitch, a quick change hitch that was installed so that it could be towed to the site. This is the finished product before, the, uh, before our collection trip. And it was tested on the North Saskatchewan River and all went well. You can see the, the, uh, sorry. You can see the axles here in the hub, which are both removable. The hitch is over here. Some of the other additional features uh, was that there were um, a flat aluminum bar was installed at the periphery of the barge, uh, flush with the deck. This allowed us um, areas to attach strapping. It also allowed us um, to install a temporary railing for the actual collection itself. Um, the other um, feature you may have seen in that last photograph is that there was a one inch thick um, high density polyethylene sheet that was used at the bow which was attached to the boat. A second sheet was used uh, behind that which you'll see a little bit in, or in the video how that worked. The interior of the barge all plywood construction featured three stringers and a four aft divider which separated the interior of the barge into, into eight watertight compartments. Twelve bilge pumps were installed and the, um, bar, uh, the barge was designed to be able to take on water in at least two of those compartments and still be able to travel. Luckily we did not have to test that theory. And a few other things, accessory things, were, were built in, in preparation for this move. There were two specialized slings that were made. A first that was a cradle sling that was used for the initial move onto the barge. A second sling was used for the hoist into the crate that we built that will be used for the temporary exhibit and for moving. So this is the video that was created for the unveiling of the stump at the Royal Alberta Museum. The expedition to collect the stump happened in mid-September of this year. Uh, there were two, or this project was supported by three jet boats. These two are taking the empty barge upstream before, the, before the, um, we collected it. The closest road access was at the Berlin Bridge, approximately eight kilometers, kilometers downstream from the site itself. Because of the high water that we experienced over the summer, the stump had been submerged for most of the summer and there was quite a bit of sediment that had been built up around it. So the first thing we did was prepare the site, which was fairly narrow and steep. And so we dug around the specimen to remove that extra sediment. And because of the high angle that the stump is tilted towards the river, we dug underneath the stump to return it to a more level position to accommodate or facilitate the approach of the barge. Next, the stump was, um, we used stra straps around the circumference of it to provide a little bit of support for it. There are some cracks within the specimen, not major or structural, but to provide some support. The barge was attached to the workhorse jet boat and moved into place. If you notice, there are uh, ropes from the shoreline with gas-powered winches to provide a little bit of stability while the stump was being moved on. The barge was pushed underneath the stump and reached almost halfway or more underneath it. So a lot of the job was already done. The sling, the cradle sling was attached and two winches uh, pulled, walked the stump onto the barge. You'll see the second piece of, of sheeting here, which actually made it move quite smoothly. Because the second piece wasn't actually attached to the barge, we could adjust the, the location of the stump so that the um, barge itself moved rather smoothly downstream. When we got to the um, boat launch, uh, the Alberta Motor Association generously provided a truck for us to haul it to Edmonton. The two bar, uh, boats moved it into position and the truck um, used a winch to pull the barge itself onto the truck. I just want to mention that all the aerial footage here was shot by Travis Shiwi, who just happened to be camping in the area at the time, so we were very lucky that that happened. Um, so once the barge was pulled onto the truck and the truck as a tilt deck was moved into position and everything strapped down, we all kind of breathed a sigh of relief because this, we felt that the most technically challenging part of the move was over with at this point. Uh, at this point, the barge or the stump was moved to one of our warehouses in Edmonton uh, where it was allowed to dry out for a little bit. And the decision was made that we wanted to put this on display for a short period of time at the museum. It was given a quick clean and we made plans for the next phase or the next move. 
So in this case, we had a second sling built to hoist the specimen into a specially built box uh, crate. And that crate, we used uh, two layers of plywood. And the underside, there were 16 uh, casters installed to sort of distribute the weight. We, of course, scheduled the move um, just after the largest snowfall of the fall <laughs> that paralyzed the city, but we persevered. And uh, the move was actually going to be our first opportunity to see the underside of the specimen, which we had no idea what the character of that was. And also, um, so the underside appeared to be actually fairly concave, and a lot of that coal veneer is intact on the base, which is fairly interesting. And it was the first opportunity we had to get a true weight of the specimen. So the, end, it, the, end, the true weight is 6,690 kilograms, pounds, sorry. <laughs> and we moved it in the, into the crate. The crate was filled with sand to provide a nice even surface to provide complete support to the entire base of the specimen. And also a little bit of confining pressure. I did mention in the field we did notice a few cracks. Um, and so we hoped that the sand would provide complete support for the specimen so that it wouldn't be um, pulling on itself or, or uh, extending those cracks in any way. So the next part, it was moved to the truck, on the truck to the museum. And that went without incident. And at the museum, we had a bit of an issue where, where our entry point is and where the gallery is, is not entirely all slab on grade. So to um, work with that, we used plywood to distribute the weight and also to protect the terrazzo floor and the carpeting in the feature gallery. From this point, our exhibits people took over and built a, or clad the, the, the existing crate with nicer wood and plexi and installed uh, the exhibit itself. <laughs> anyway, so this is a picture on the day of the exhibit uh, unveiling. So our exhibits people did a fantastic job in a very short period of time. The purpose of this exhibit is to show or give the public a bit of a behind the scenes uh, view of how specimens are collected, how field work happens, and, and how an exhibit comes together. Uh, it's all, this will also be the only opportunity that people will have to see the specimen before it goes back into storage and, and for preparation for the next few years. Um, up next, so during that time, there are a few research questions that we want to answer, and there's also conservation work that needs to happen. I did mention the cracks that exist. They don't appear to be structural, but they will need to be dealt with. The veneer of coal is rather delicate, so we will have to make some decisions about how to stabilize that. And we also, because of that, um, the level of detail that's been preserved and the small-scale uh, small detail that's been preserved, we hope to be able to answer some questions about the origin of the specimen, and the exact species. I just want to take the time to thank a few very important people and organizations that contributed to this. Again, we would, if we had not known about this, it never would have happened. So thank you to Don and Julia Waddell, who reported it to the province. And of course, the Royal Tyrell Museum provided a lot of support, well and above and beyond what was expected. And the Alberta Motor Association, Alpha Pickers, and Windsor Plywood all donated time and resources. And there are many other individuals and organizations that contributed to this project. So if anyone has any questions.